Thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you to the Estonia Society and Estonia Europe, Monica and Andrea, I don't know where they are, uh, there you go, uh, for inviting me to present and for being really uh, great supporters um, of my work. So I'm going to run you through in the next 20, 25 minutes, um, pretty much 12 years of work. So um, I'll try and keep it short. Uh, and I'm going to present to you one of the occupational therapy interventions that we managed to do as part of my PhD. I said we, it's probably I managed to do as my PhD. So um, this work is uh, the work of many people across my clinical team. Um, um, I work with Jean-Pierre Lin, who's going to be presenting after me, um, and many occupational therapists across the United Kingdom, loads of MSc students. So it was a big, big undertaking. And then I, I want to acknowledge that some of this work and, and the fellowship that I got to do this work was possible thanks to a generous donation from um, a grant that we got from the Estonia Society to analyze some of my clinical data that then helped me put a, a, a proposal together for my fellowship. So, um, this is a, a disclosure that um, the study was funded by the National Institute of Health Research uh, here in the UK. Uh, some of you will have seen the videos that I'm going to uh, show you today, but hopefully um, I can give you um, some new information as well. So I am a children's therapist, um, and um, by that uh, we cover children, young people, up to the age of 21, so one could argue that a 21-year-old is not a child anymore, it's a young person, but I want you to think, even if you work with adults with Estonia or you are an adult with Estonia, that some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, might apply as well um, to your daily lives, because we know um, Estonia is a lifelong disorder. Uh, during my presentation, you might hear me talk more about HMD, hyperkinetic movement disorders, and that's because I'm going to use that as an umbrella term, because in um, childhood onset um, movement disorders, we do have uh, not just dystonia as the main uh, phenotype. Sometimes we've got other things going on as well. So, to me, the... Um, the thing about the definition of dystonia, and you will know this um, definition yourselves, but what, what I am interested in is on the um, words that I have highlighted there, and is that as an occupational therapist, my job is to enable people to be able to do the things that they want to do in daily life. And what happens to my young people with dystonia when they try to do something is that the more they try to do something, the more dystonic they become. So it's pretty difficult to do any therapy when what you do with therapy is getting somebody to become even more dystonic. Hence why there's no evidence for what we do as physiotherapists, occupational therapists, or speech and language therapists. We heard Karen earlier on say, you know, there's not a lot of evidence for a speech and language therapy. And the treatments that we've got for childhood onset HMD, um, they tend to be more medical. Uh, so we know we've got some uh, pharmacological interventions, we've got toxin, and we've got obviously uh, deep brain stimulation, and we've heard a little bit um, about that before. But we don't, and I couldn't find a better picture of um, occupational therapy. It's, this is not what we do, but I like the uh, graphic. So that's just to exemplify more kind of your rehabilitation. Um, we don't know much about how we can do this because we don't have any studies that have looked at what we can do with young people with dystonia. So this is part of the work that, was, uh, that I was able to do with uh, the grant from Dystonia Society and I am hoping we will be able to submit this uh, for publication very soon. And this is an assessment that I do as part of my clinical work where I get young people to come into the kitchen or do two things that they want to be able to do, their standardized um, tasks. So it might be making a sandwich and making a drink. And we look at um, something called motor and process skills. So motor, everybody understands you know the way you move. And process relates more about if something goes wrong, 
can I just change what I'm doing and do it in a, in a different way? Now, what happens with young people with dystonia, as you probably, as we've heard and as you probably know, is that if you, if your arm is becoming really dystonic and it's kind of pulling you away while you're trying to fry an egg, then if something goes wrong, it's quite difficult to then concentrate on what you're doing because you know, you've got pain, your arm is moving you away. So what happens is, what we found is that young people have both difficulties with motor things when they were doing the test, but also with the problem solving skills, if you like. And what happened with DBS is that we managed to get an improvement, not just on the motor, so things, the dystonia got better, but also their ability to, um, to change performance when something was, was going wrong and uh, to change what problem solve also improved. Um, so that's um, quite nice. Um, and also this data, um, what we did is we paid somebody that didn't know whether it was before or after DBS to rate the videos, because someone might say, well, you work in the service, you want them to get better. And that's right, we all have a bias. Uh, so that's why we kind of randomized the video and we gave them in different orders to somebody to rate them. Uh, so this is actually quite good data. Um, and the thing to me is that, yes, they've improved with DBS, so that's great. But anything below the red line means that um, people still have difficulties and they are um, performing below where they should be performing for the age. So DBS is not a cure and we can move people in the right direction, but what we found is that uh, young people were still coming down to our service saying, H, it's great that my dystonia is better, but I still can't ride a bike. I still can't catch a ball in the playground. Um, so my friends don't want to play with me and I still can't do the things that I want to be able to do. So this was quite frustrating for me because um, we've got young people from across the country that come um, to have DBS in our center, but we don't have occupational therapists across the country working with this young people. And what occupational therapists were telling me is that we don't know how to treat them, there's no evidence, so they weren't treating them. So that was uh, really why I did my PhD. It was out of frustration to try and find out whether we could do something for these young people. So what we did is uh, the, all the young people in the study had DBS and what we did is we gave an intervention called the COP approach, and I'm going to show you some videos and um, tell you a little bit about the approach. And this has now been published in neurology, so we did two studies. So the first study is now published, and you know, if you want to get access, um, I'm more than happy to email you a copy. Um, and COP stands for Cognitive Orientation to Daily Occupational Performance. So it's a cognitive approach. Um, I don't go there and move people's arms or legs, or I actually don't do any, I don't do very much. I just do more of a guiding, I don't do very much. Um, my job is actually to help the young person uh, problem solve and work ways around the problems. Uh, so it's based on motor learning principles. So when I heard Tali earlier on um, talk about her um, a sports psychologist and some of the strategies, um, it was really interesting for me and it was music to my ears because I'll show you some of our results. So basically this approach comes from those, um, from that motor learning uh, literature that probably that sports psychologist is using as well. But the, the thing with um, the COPE approach is about reaching, doing any activity that the child might want to do, or as we heard this morning, kind of reaching those life goals that somebody might have. So in terms of the evidence that we have, we've got quite a lot of evidence for co-op, and the largest evidence that we have is in adults, in adults with a stroke. So this is why I'm saying, don't think about this intervention as a children's intervention, think about an this is an intervention um, to enable people to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. So it's 
functionally targeted, so if it's based on function, it's uh, client-centered, so we work on whatever the goals are for that young person, and it uses those cognitive strategies um, to reach functional goals or life goals, as we heard. And the key thing here is about strategies. We use those strategies that don't come from me, so I don't know the strategies. I don't have dystonia. Everybody with dystonia lives dystonia in a different way. So the strategies come within that person. And my job as a therapist is to enable that young person to come up with the strategies. And believe you me, even for problems that I thought, there is no way we're going to get there. And I'll show you some videos. They did get there. They found the strategies. I didn't think they were going to work. They worked. And um, and when I present this to occupational therapists and physiotherapists, you know, I say to them, you know, we don't understand how much people can achieve with the right intervention. We do, do need to shift in the way we do uh, our interventions. And I think the answers, many times, uh, the patients have the answers. We just need to be better at getting those answers and packaging them. So we all have different strategies and we, you know, one thing, you know, you, you, you might be very creative about how uh, you get there and that is our job as, a, as, a, as occupational therapists and AHPs in general. And, um, and something that really interested me was um, when I present this to all, other therapists is that people say, oh, well, but the way they do it, you know, they, they still have abnormal postures. I'm like, yes. And a, a, a young person with dystonia said, well, um, my goal is to carry a bowl of cereal. My goal is not to carry a bowl of cereal without dystonia. So yes, I still look dystonic, but I can carry my bowl of cereal. So we can all do things in different ways. And who am I to say that this is not the way we should fish? Well, this is the way they do it in Sri Lanka. So. Uh, I'll show you one of the videos from a young person that wanted to be able to swim and this is, um, she's been swimming for eight years and this is how much she can do. Uh, so basically at the school they've taken, taken her swimming uh, but for eight years she sat at the edge of the pool. This, you, my heart sank when I heard this and did I think that she was going to swim after five sessions of therapy? No. But then I went to South East England, you know, um, five weeks in a row, and this is how much we got. And when I presented this at an international conference um, of physiotherapists, they actually weren't impressed at all because they told me that this wasn't the normal way of swimming. And I was just like, oh, is there any physios in the room? Have I insulted you? Sorry. No physios in the room. Good. Um, she, that is the only exercise she ever gets. She was so happy that for the first time she could swim. So to me, that's good enough. She, for the first time, she was invited to actually, in her school summer, whatever, to actually swim with everybody else. So um, I wasn't too worried about not being no more swimming. So it's all about the strategies and what we did, and we were very lucky to have lots of MSc students from Toronto that did analysis on the data, we mapped all the different strategies that people were doing and I've just blown those up a little bit. And one of the key ones, which when Tali was telling us about distraction, actually one of the key strategies that came up was distraction. So we use all sorts of things like them learning new tasks where they had to somehow interrupt that loop where, you know, if they're doing something, they become more dystonic because they become anxious. So they might learn to count in Spanish, to count backwards, to, to really, really distract um, them from what the task was, like carrying a glass of water. And that seemed to work. Um, I'm not saying it works for everybody, and this is why the therapists need to be able to um, guide the person um, to, to wherever that person wants to go because different strategies work, will work for different people. So I think there's something in this. Uh, I heard Karen as well this morning, the speech and language therapist, saying some of the strategies that might work and how... And we hear this, but there's no enough research being done in terms of, 
of whether we could tweak and finesse these strategies to actually get um, uh, more success across more people. So um, this is uh, one of the young people that actually taught me uh, about what could work and he used a distraction strategy. He was one of the first young people in the study. He wanted to carry a glass of water and his a strategy, and I did not come up with this, he's, I said to him, do your movements, do they become better at any point in your daily life, in your day to day? And he said, yes. We, I've got a strategy that I use with my psychotherapist that um, when I go to talk to him, I say, okay, well, can we use that strategy when we carry the glass of water? So this came from him. So he was c carrying the glass of water and then he was saying, I don't give a damn, I don't give a damn, I don't give a damn. And somehow, I'm not saying that you go and do that, but somehow he was able to overwrite those involuntary movements that he has for that brief period of time when doing that task and then carry the glass of water. Um, so this is, um, am I about to finish? Okay, so the, 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 the important thing with this intervention is not so much what we work in therapy because you're not gonna have one of us attached to you all day long. What we want is to have generalization and transfer for the young person to be able to then use those strategies when I'm not there doing anything they wanna do. So it's more about within the person trying to get um, those strategies going. So based on that, we did not work on this goal. So this is the same young person. And we didn't work on, on drinking, but he was able to get some of the same strategies and some of it is distraction, but is combined with some of the way he positions his arm and his wrist. And then all of that uh, meant that he was able to do it. So just to, fit, to wrap it up, I took two young, person, two young people from the study to present with me at one of the conferences. And this was, to me, one of the most powerful messages that we could have. So I'm just going to show you what one of the young people was saying um, about co-op. And she was saying about how much confidence he had given her and that she could literally feel like she could do anything. Physically being able to ride a bike is amazing, but it's much more than that. Imagine being really bad at a subject in school for years, and everybody's going to tell you you're never going to pass it, never mind do well on it, and then you have to take the biggest test you're ever going to have to take in that subject, and you get an A+. So to show you um, Grace, and this video we had to thank you to Elko and the guy at the back that last minute we had to change things. So she wanted to ride a bike. So on a straight line. And she did achieve this uh, with Cobo, but of course none of us ride a bike for 10 meters in a garden and that's it. Um, so the important thing about this is that when we went back, uh, ignore the one on the left, when we went back three months later, so this is doing no extra therapy. So it took us 183 minutes of therapy. So not 100 hours, 183 minutes of therapy. This is what she was able to do with the strategies by herself, with her brother. And this is powerful. This is powerful because not only she can ride the bike, for the first time she doesn't need to use the wheelchair in the shopping mall because she is stronger. You know, she's got the strategies to now do all the things that she wants to do, like being able to open her own front door so that she can get home by her, herself, being able to problem solve, she's considering doing a psychology degree and living home and living independently. So to me, it is quite powerful. Um, so the studies, obviously, we did two studies. The first one I've shown you, but I think Karen was saying earlier on, um, that you know, we need to get uh, more people. It's not good if you only have one person that can do this, right? So I was the therapist for this. So was, well, that's not very good if we've got people in Scotland that can't do it or if we've got, so we need to be able to get more therapists on board. And this is what we tried to do with the second study. And I'm just gonna show you one of the young people. And the reason why I'm showing you this, we did, baseline where we didn't do any intervention we did we went i went up to scotland and i tried doing sips for like six weeks 18 times you know how people talk about practice makes perfect well if what you're practicing is the wrong thing what you become very good at is doing the wrong thing 
So practice doesn't make perfect if what you're practicing is not good. And um, so basically, this is just, I'm just going to run. This is to show you that she doesn't make any changes. So that scale is scale 1 to 10. She actually, just by practicing doing the set, she doesn't get better. Um, and this is a young person that did achieve getting her SIP. So really, just to wrap up, and this is my last slide, one, two slides. Um, we really don't understand yet um, how this motor performance is mediated by cognition, but there seem to be more to it than we originally thought. Um, and this is where I want to move it along to see what we need to do next. So we've got collaborations, we've got data, and we've got um, strong links with uh, the two uh, patient charities here. So I would like to hear from you about where we should go next. Uh, so that's my email address and my Twitter. And I will finish now. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to do that to you. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me do it as one question. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. So again, yet another speaker who's really understanding that... Can you hear me? Is this switched on? Can you it hear now. me now? Yeah, it is now. Um, another speaker who is, is totally understanding about our need to actually move this through quite aggressively. So thank you for that. Yeah. So are there any questions? We've got one question and then Hortensia will be around for lunch yes. after our final speaker. Yes, yep. lady in the green at the front. Yes, it's coming now, just behind you. There we go. I'm, I'm thinking that, um, I'm sure the cognitive side of it works a lot, um, but part of it is maybe having somebody actually think about what it's like to be you as a unique person and not being able to do things and having unique mm -hmm. difficulties and having somebody else that you can think about thinking about you makes it less lonely yes. and isolating. And, and it's mm -hmm. like you've got a group in your head yes. thinking, maybe that helps as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, kind of, you know, the, the society in your head. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like it's, it's a personalised approach, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And then you want to scale that personalised yeah. medicine, don't you? Really? I do, we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Hortense. Thank you.